IABC, Imina region, uh, to here to this beautiful Vilnius, which is sunny and nice today. And, um, and uh, some of you may be wondering what do those acronyms mean? So International Association of Business Communicators is a global network uh, which is already decade years old. So a very well established global or association of business communicators which uh, connects thousands of members worldwide. And Imina, a very interesting region to name and that's Europe, Middle East and North Africa. So this event and these speakers are going to be streamed to, through Facebook to all of the region, to all of the members all around. So I say hi to you and welcome here live. And I also say hi to everybody who has connected over Facebook to us and they will be listening. And some of the important moments to say is that you may ask questions and you may ask questions by using the technologies that we have. You can go to sli.do and put the hashtag IABC and this is how all the questions are going to come in through the speakers. When you ask a question, you can indicate to whom you are asking. Uh, we will try to ask as many questions as possible. Also, uh, our virtual participants can do the same. This is, this is very easily accessible for everyone. So with no delay, I guess I will invite our first speaker to the stage, and that is Mike Klein. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> Mike Klein is the chairman of the board of IABC Imina, and he's going to take it over from me. No more introductions needed. <laughs> okay. Um, probably a little more introduction from me, just so you can get where I'm coming from. Um, I've been involved with the International Association of Business Communicators since 2001. Um, I've been involved with country activities across Europe and also in the United States. You can probably tell by my accent that I'm not from around here. I'm actually from Chicago, which is a city with a very robust Lithuanian population. Um, and I've been chair of IABC in the region um, since July. And when I'm not doing this, I have my own um, communications practice based in the Netherlands. I work with large companies on internal communications and external issues, um, mainly around big problems that they're having. So, and I'm going to speak from notes because I want to make sure that I get all the concepts across. So I apologize if you see me fluttering around with pieces of paper or anything like that. Um, but it's really a pleasure to open this leadership institute here in Vilnius. And this has been something that V and I have talked about for quite some time. Um, and it was, we saw this as an opportunity, rather than just simply having another event where IBC folks talk among themselves, to actually come to a new place, a new country, introduce ourselves, and demonstrate the value um, that we can offer individual communicators and also to the enterprises and societies that they represent. Um, it's also a new format. It's mostly um, conference. It's mostly workshop. Um, and there's also going to be some opportunity for informal networking, both after the session today. Um, we're going to have a reception, and then we're going to have an um, opportunity to join the, the leadership for dinner this evening if anybody's suitably free. But also tomorrow, we're going to be having some hands-on workshops and then we're going to go, you know, really explore the city together as a group, those of us who are still around. So the goal, and really this is kind of the uber hashtag, of, and if anybody doesn't understand what I'm saying or if I'm speaking too fast, please stop and interrupt me. Um, but there's an uber hashtag for IABC called Create Connection. And that's really what this is about, um, you know, for the next, two, you know, really the next day and a half. And inside of that, there's a theme. There's, the theme. there's a theme around raising your communication game. Um, we've got international speakers who've come in. I've, I know most of these people, and I can see what they do, and they will definitely help you do that. And also your local speakers who I've heard about 
will also make an excellent contribution in that direction. Okay. How do I do this? Ah. Apologies for this. I will get the hang of it shortly. Um, and tomorrow we've also, particularly, there's a session with a fellow by the name of Stuart Maester, who was a master storyteller. And he's worth the price of admission. I mean, granted, the price of admission is free. He's more than worth that. But, I mean, he's definitely worth the time and exertion that would be required to come in tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. for that workshop. So the name of this session is called Five Ways Communicators Can Make a Tangible Impact. And I've kind of subtitled that as Practical Guidance in Courageous Communication. And courageous communication is an underlying theme to our proceedings over the next couple of days. And there's been a great example in this community of an exercise in, cour in courageous communication. The campaign, Vilnius is the G-spot of Europe, is undoubtedly a great example of courageous communication. And we're going to be talking about that a bit later, but I think that also helps set the context for what we're going to be talking about. But what I'd really like to talk about is our roles as communication professionals from a standpoint of courageous communication. So there's five tangible ways that I'm going to present about how to have a tangible impact as a courageous communicator. But before I introduce the specific examples, I'd just like to have a very quick conver conversation about courage. Does anybody here have a definition of courage. What do you think courage is? Does anybody have the courage to even admit that they have a definition? There's some courage. Excellent. Also, just not being afraid. Right. It's acting. Well, it's not necessarily not being afraid of anything. It's actually being afraid of something, but doing it anyways. That's what courageous communication is about. And it doesn't mean that you have to be like paralyzed with fear to be courageous. There can be just even the slightest sense that something might be a little bit off or a little bit unusual or a little bit difficult. There's a real difference between courage and fearlessness. Fearlessness is you go in the face of whatever, no matter, what, no matter the winds are 100, you know, 300 kilometers an hour. Courage is a bit more accessible than that. And what I want to do really over the next few minutes is to provide you with some very tangible ideas about how to make that courageousness more and more accessible and more practicable on a day-to-day -day basis. Another way to look at, look at it is the nature of being a communicator yourself. It takes bravery to be a communicator. It takes bravery in wanting to make change. It takes bravery to be willing to be the one who makes that change, to do the something that alters the flow of history in an organization or a community, whether the change is tiny or massive. Any questions on that, just so we we're clear about what we're talking about here? We're talking about courage, not fearlessness, and we're talking about it being something tangible and accessible. And I'm promising you at least five ways communicators can make an impact. One more thing I want to add before we get into these five things, partially because I added it a little bit later, but I think it's worth mentioning, is my firm, my practice is called Changing the Terms. And it's really about how we as communicators and how I as a communicator make a difference in the world in which I operate. And I'm more of a writer than a facilitator or a manager. I'm, you know, somebody who actually gets into the mechanics of how words interact with each other. When you change the words, you change the terms. When you change the terms, you change the rules. And when you change the rules, you change the game. So I come at this from a perspective of an internal communicator. For the last 20 years, I've been working largely inside big organizations like Shell, like Cargill, like the United States federal government, uh, Maersk, 
um, company called Vimplecom, which runs, which owns um, mobile phone networks all across the former Soviet Union. Beeline being the Russian um, operating company that they have. And so my take on this is really coming from being an internal communicator. I do some external work. I do some Marcom's work. I do some work in helping big companies position themselves in those markets. But I still call myself an internal communicator, not because it's what I do, but it's a lot more about who I am. And what it really comes down to is that being an internal communicator is addictive. And why is being an internal communicator addictive? Because you get to see the impact of your work. You get to see what you, your contribution and how it makes a difference in the end product. By the way, can anybody recognize the building that's being shown here? Does anybody know what this building is? Can anybody, does anybody recognize this building or can, or can anyone identify this? No. This is the new Tottenham Hotspur football stadium in London, which is in its final stages of construction. I just wanted to see if there were any Spurs fans in the audience. Um, so what makes internal communications addictive? Um, people can see your, you know, pe you can see how people react to your work and how it impacts the organization and community. You can do it live and you can do it in, in real time. Like when you see people reading your copy, I mean when I was at EasyJet Airlines, I was doing the merger communication back in 2001, and they were a paperless airline. I said, you're not going to be a paperless airline during the merger. You're going to have a paper newsletter. And so what? They had a paper newsletter. And you know what happened? You got to see the people reading the paper newsletter. And that had an impact on two levels. One is you got to see, you know, X percentage of the people were actually reading the darn thing. But the other thing is you notice that the people who weren't reading it were making note of the people who were. So in fa if, you know, if questions came up about what was going on in the airline during the merger, people would first go to the people who actually read the newsletter to find out what was going on. So it actually improved internal communication and it actually created a visible difference that you could see and that they could see because they knew where to go for the information, even if they weren't consuming it themselves. Another point, when a subject you've shared starts to end up on the real organizational agenda. Has anybody ever experienced this? You had an idea and all of a sudden, two, three months later, other people started talking about it? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about here. That's why, that's why I do what I do to a large extent. And my personal favorite is when senior executives opt to use the stronger wording that you suggest rather than the boring wording that they would have come up with on their own. These are the things that have kept me in this business for the last 20 years. And so now I'm going to share some tangible tips for making a difference as a professional communicator. And these are not tips that are required to be used solely in an internal context although because of the nature of internal communications, it's often easier to see that they're being used. So the first step in the impact of their use. So the first step is ask the best questions. Be really, really good at asking questions. One of the things that I learned late in my career is that if I've got an idea, if I've got an idea, if I think I know the answer to something, don't raise my hand and say I've got the answer raise my hand and, come and rephrase that answer as a question and then project it as a question, either for validation or to stimulate a larger conversation. The advantage of that being you don't come across as arrogant, but yet you get the ball rolling in the direction in which you want it to go. Another couple of tricks. I always like to ask for three answers to the questions that I ask, wherever it makes sense. So if I'm interviewing somebody, um, like I'm, interview I'm doing a, survey, a research project now looking at um, employee engagement and technology, my first question is, what are your three biggest employee engagement challenges? That's a much different question from what is your biggest employee engagement challenge. Does everybody understand why? 
Because the first thing is the first thing that comes to mind. That's the easy stuff. The second thing is the second most easy thing. And the third thing is something they really have to think about in order to complete the exercise. And that's where the gold starts to come out. The second is to ask the same basic question from different angles. Ask what are your biggest challenges and then ask what are your most pressing challenges. Because then you've got a spread. You've got, okay, here are the priorities, but here's what I'm actually working on. Is there a gap? Is there a problem? Is there an issue? And then you actually have a space for a real conversation about the, the gap between the two. You create fresher ideas and a sharper context. Any questions so far? Okay. Second item. Generate and share insightful data even if it isn't perfect. I know some people come from scientific backgrounds, they come from research backgrounds, and they're afraid to share research that isn't methodologically super sound. But in the business world, managers and senior managers love data. They love numbers. And we're trained to believe that what they want to see is numbers, but actually, they also like words when the words have some power to them. They like seeing verbatims. And injecting numbers and words can accelerate understanding and can speed up the conversations that we want and need to have with the people that we work with. And I'm not, just, I'm not talking about measurement here. I'm not talking about measuring eyeballs and hits and trying to demonstrate that everybody's paying attention. Some topics don't require everybody to pay attention. Some topics require 5% of the people to pay attention and actually do something while the other 95% get out of the way or sit back and watch. But the key things to look at from a measurement perspective are changes in attitudes, trends, you know, how things are progressing over time. And one particular way to track changes in attitudes is to see whether your stakeholders embrace, reject, or adapt the language that you use. So for example, in the business world, in the internal communications and change world, we're constantly reorganizing. Organizations are constantly trying to make themselves more efficient. And so sometimes the company will say, this is the resource optimization program. And sometimes employees will say, this is the cost cutting program, again. And so, when you're asking people what are the three biggest things facing the company, you can see how many people say resource optimization program and say fucking cost cutting program. And you can re you've got some really hard tangible evidence to measure and you're not even putting the words out. You're collecting the words that they're using and seeing whether it tracks the language you prefer. And we come back to that ever courageous and wonderful Vilnius G-Spot campaign. Has anybody, before this campaign, did anybody ever consider Vilnius to be the G-spot of Europe? No. After this campaign, is anybody ever going to think that this was a spontaneous concept? No. Any use of the term Vilnius and G-spot in the same sentence is going to be directly trackable to this campaign. Does everybody see that? Excellent. The third tangible tip is to seize the power of the pen and the touchpad. As communications professionals, we need to remind ourselves, but we have to remind ourselves, that we're not secretaries. We don't take dictation. We're not here to take dictation. We are authors, and we propose new ideas. We create new language. We sharpen messages, and we shape actions and the environments in which actions take place. We are actually editors of outcomes as well as texts. So what does that mean for writers? My favorite line is, draft ambitiously and accept editing gracefully. And for editors, remember that you are not here to edit the text, but to edit the world in which those texts are received. Words have impact. In a world that prizes digital and visual brilliance, and the certainty of numbers. It is words that are our currency, 
that give our work lasting impact. I've done a lot of ghostwriting in my career. I've done a ton of it. And my favorite response when I interact with a senior manager is when I get back a smile and that manager says, did I say that? I said, read it out loud. She reads it out loud. And then I said, okay, you said it. And that's why the fourth element, being clear on your organization's goals and ambitions, is necessary to enable you to have the right kind of impact. Because you can't always be in sync with an organization or with a community or with a network or with a market unless you really know what its ambitions are. And I think this is actually one of the biggest challenges that we face as communicators. Because a lot of time we as communicators in our organizations are not aligned. And it's because we make assumptions about the business and about its objectives. What do you think the biggest assumption that we make is? Anybody want to take a guess at this one? It's a tough one because it's not obvious. But it's when we assume that what the organization says it's want, what it wants, when the organization or when the leader or when, the, for that matter, the politician says what they want. And they actually want something else. And to a certain extent, our job is to figure out what that gap is. And then to either close that gap or at least be responsible for that gap in the way we communicate. Because once you're clear on where the organization or where your client actually wants to go, you're in a much better position to help drive them there. And perhaps to move them more quickly than your peers and colleagues bring, think possible. The fifth is about mobilizing satisfied customers. Reputation means a lot in our business. And reputation plus network equals power. And during, when you use the skills, when you use the tips that I've suggested, and most of you are probably using them anyways, you inevitably create some satisfied customers. And so the fifth opportunity I share today is about mobilizing those satisfying customer, satisfied customers. They're the ones who reinforce the impact you can deliver. They're the ones who can vouch for you, particularly in a difficult situation, and they can demonstrate the value that your interventions have created to their organizations or to their teams or to their, their own individual roles. They can, ex they can provide you with access to new networks and they can amplify your case stories. Externally, that can involve getting them to help you make their ca your case. I mean, a great example of this was I have a CFO that I work with. He's a guy who's CFO at Staples Solutions, the, um, the big office um, warehouse organization, but he used to work with me at, a, at an oil company in Denmark. And we worked so well together that he, he allowed me to ghostwrite an article on the value, the financial value that communicators provide to organizations. And so when you can get a stakeholder to sing not just your praises, but the praises of your entire profession in a public document, which ended up actually getting published in the magazine of the European Association of Communication Directors. Um, you know, the power of that is absolutely immense. So to summarize, the five suggestions I want to leave you with, ask the best questions, generate and share insightful data, seize the power of the pen and the touchpad, be crystal clear on your organization's goals and objectives. Mobilize your satisfied customers. As I said, I'm sure that all of you are at least doing some of these things a good portion of the time. But the key thing is to be vocal about it, to be courageous about it, and most importantly, be conscious about it, to recognize that these are actually the things that you need to be doing to give you power in your role. And if you are seeking to have even more impact, Ask yourself what more you can do, what more you can learn, and whom else you can join forces with. Which brings you to the bonus item. I'm actually giving you six. <laughs> six for the price of five. 
And this is about, and this is getting to another level of courageous communication. It's actually about being the one who makes the connection in your organization, market, and community. One of my favorite pictures in all of business is, does anybody know what this is? Does anybody know which airline this is? flights are coming out of Atlanta. Does anybody know this? You mentioned it, Alex. It's Delta. This is the Delta Airlines route map. It's the best example that I've seen because Atlanta's the biggest, but it's not the only hub that connects all of these hundreds of cities in America with each other. Each of us can be a hub. Each of us can make the connections, but even more than what Delta does, which is bringing all of, the peop all of these lines into one place and then shooting th things out in a way that's me-centric, you can actually put them together directly. But even when you put them together directly, you're still part of the connection. There's still a triangle. You have created a relationship between two people in a way that actually creates a relationship between three people. But the key thing is to be conscious and courageous about it. Introduce people who you know, A, probably don't know each other, and B, would really be good or useful or positive in their interaction together. Inside of companies, this can be huge. This can accelerate the way companies operate and the way companies organize. In markets, even huger. By making the connections between the right people, you help them and the world in which they operate become more connected and agile. And by being the one who's made the connections, you become much better connected yourself. Externally, the opportunities are powerful, and personally, and making yourself an increasingly critical part of your community and your industry's network. And this is true even in a small country. You know, my wife is from a country that's even smaller than yours. She's Icelandic. I think Iceland's population is 300,000. What's the population of Lithuania? Almost 3 million. Okay, so Iceland is about maybe 12% of the population of Lithuania. But even in Iceland, there are people who don't know each other. And also, as part of IABC, you get to know people outside of your country who could be of value who can be of support, who can be of service, and you can introduce them to the people here and therefore strengthen your own communicator's community while you strengthen your own role as a leader and as a source of inspiration in your world. So I want to thank you very much for having me. I want to thank you even more for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, do we have any questions? I haven't seen any questions online, so maybe somebody on the... Um, if not, then I'm going to ask you a question. Out of Great. those five plus one, um, can you name a po point in your life when you had a make or break moment and whether one of those five tips helped you? I'd say... Okay. I would say two or three cases. In terms of making introductions and connections, um, that's, always, that's always helped me, particularly in terms of, you know, sometimes when you go into an organization and you're courageous, you, you do get in a bit of trouble. And your ability to reach somebody who knows somebody who's giving you trouble is often, you know, that's often a get, of, get out of jail card, frankly. Um, so that's, you know, it, number six can be a lifesaver if you do it properly. Um, asking good questions always helps in tough situations. Even, you know, like for example, when I was at Vimplecom, there was a new CEO, new comms director, everybody was very intimidated, nobody was asking questions. And I purposely came in with a couple of difficult but positive questions. Such as? Um, I don't remember what they were because they were pertaining to the annual financial results. 
and they were also pertaining to some of the language that the CEO was using to describe a rather intimidating sounding change program that he was about to implement or really inflict on the organization. And I asked him, why do you use the word profound all the time? Because every, every third word that came out of his mouth was profound. Prof this will be profound change. We will profoundly, you know, it, it was the, the biggest adjective. And I hate adjectives as a writer, as a general rule. Um, and so I asked him in, in a room full of 500 rather worried employees, why are you saying the word profoundly? And he actually explained himself in a very lucid, um, detensifying sort of way. And for the time I remained at the company, whenever I walked into the elevator with him, he'd always say hello. And he didn't say, he didn't do that with too many of the other employees. Um, you know, he, you know, I never developed a deep personal relationship with him, but he knew who I was and he appreciated that I, that I had the guts to ask the question. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Any more questions? If not, then I ask to give another round of applause to Mike. Thank you very much.